We're in the 10th chapter, looking at all the different truly, truly, I say unto you doctrines that John recorded of this new and unique teaching method. It is the Amen method in the Old Testament. It was uh, doxology. It was to point out important relevancy of, of doctrines. Jesus used it on the front of his teaching rather than at the end. In the Old Testament, they put it at the end of a doctrine. Jesus put it at the beginning and doubled it. In the Old Testament, you get time, you can look at Deuteronomy at some time and, and show how the amen was used, doxology or teaching doctrine in the Old Testament. They would put it at the end of a, a doxology. Jesus put it at the beginning, and then he doubled the amen. Uh, translated in the English, truly, truly. And so John records um, half the book of John uh, has m maybe, maybe more than that. I don't know. He's about 25 references of amens. And they're key doctrines that Jesus felt Israel should know and, and we as a church. So that's where we are. Uh, and it, I have to introduce this because that's what Christ did. And you'll never understand chapter 10 unless you understand chapter 9. <laughs> And we'll, we'll discuss that this morning. Chapter 9 is essential to understand chapter 10 and the Messianic teaching. Now, what's interesting is that the, 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 he was attacked for healing the blind man from, you know, the blind man from birth. Remember that guy? Well, he got terribly, uh, terribly, terribly attacked about that because he did it on Sabbath, uh, which was a sign that he was the Lord of the Sabbath that the Sabbath system was set up to declare who Christ was. Of course, they missed all that because they, didn't, they carried a Bible but didn't study it. Um, so he heals this blind man, and they attack him. They attack his parents, and they attack the, the man who was healed. They attack Jesus, attack the, the parents, and they attack the guy unmercifully. In fact, they excommunicated him for being healed on the Sabbath. They threw him out. The Bible says. Out of that attack comes John 10th chapter. John, the, and 21 verses, we, in 21 verses, we have two truly sayings. It's given to these Pharisees who have attacked Christ for healing this man on the Sabbath. What's interesting, and we'll read it, and I broke it down, I broke these down in two parts, verses 1 through 6, and then 7 through 21. This week, I'm going to do 1 through 6 because we have to understand chapter 9 to understand what he's going to tell them. But what's interesting is that he introduces this subject in verse 10, in chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, here it, here it goes because you got your Bibles open. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way. Now, there was only one way. That sheep pit was built by walls. It had four walls with exception on the front. It had a gate. A gate. An open gate. Okay? And so it's a sheep gate. It's an open area. The only way Jesus says you can get into the, the sheep pen is through the door. That's why the door is there. Right? Kids used to leave the door open, and they would say to us at the farm, were you, were you born in the barn? I never did understand that because we kept all the doors shut. So I don't know what that meant. But I knew it wasn't a good one. Uh, so, but I never did understand the logic behind it. Well, anyhow, uh, he who, now watch this because it's important. This whole thing is about how you enter the door, which is the sheep gate. He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, the sheep pen, but climbs up some other way, that would be a wall, he is a thief and a robber. In other words, his intent is terrible, isn't it? He doesn't, he's not after the welfare of the sheep, right? 
Okay, there's a point. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. That's a security guard. Sometimes a shepherd stay out, and if he, if he had a brother or, or had enough money, he would hire somebody. If, he, if there was enough people in the family, like uh, where David's family, where he had so many brothers, then the youngest probably would get stuck out there because the rest of the guys were out with the sheep all day. They came home, went to bed, and the guy who wasn't out there all day, he pulled night duty. That's the porter or the gatekeeper. But normally, normally the shepherd slept there. Now, remember, it's an open gate. It's not a door. It's an open gate. And you slept in the gate. No, no, none of the sheep got out. None of the bad people got in. Okay. It was a, a security guard at night. Uh, that's the doorkeeper. To him, the doorkeeper opens, that is, the shepherd of the sheep, and the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts, and, and it's just, look, in a moment I'm going to tell you something that's really important. This sounds like a parable. It's not a parable. This sounds like an allegory. It's not an allegory. You may even think this sounds like a proverb. It's not a proverb. So if your Bible calls this a parable or an allegory, it is not. But it shows you by the, what they're, what they're going to call it, shows you how difficult people in the English Bible are having with this. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. To him the door, okay, four. When he puts forth all his own, in other words, leads the sheep out, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. If you, if you've, listen, let me bring this down uh, out of the farm and into your home. You got a dog? Get, I don't know cats are that smart. I, I'm not a cat guy, so. I mean, cats will run away from you. You don't feed them half the time. They just go out and find something to eat. We hardly ever fed cats. We didn't have any fat cats on our farm. We've, we've already, listen, you want to eat? Go get a mouse. But anyhow. My point is, your dog knows your voice. Other people can call your dog, and they don't pay that much attention other than look. Right? But you call it, or, or if you have a special way of identity with them, they, they recognize you. Their little tail will begin to wag. Well, here's a, here's a sheep. Here's sheep. We got the same principle going on, because why? This Somebody takes care of them. Somebody takes care of them. Even sheep know that. Well, let's say, all who come before me, let's see, let's say, wait a minute. Verse 5. The sheep follow his voice. Verse 5. And a, stra and a stranger, somebody climbs up a different way, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Now watch this. My Bible calls this a figure of speech. It's exactly what it is. But it's a special it's not a parable. It's not an allegory. It's not a proverb. It's a paoriomai. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. The fact, this parable of speech is so important because he laid it out in a special debater technique in order to, to hide the doctrinal meaning from those who were negative to the Word of God and reveal it to those who were positive. This paroyomai figure of speech, it's used here in the Gospel of John. It's used in the 10th chapter and the 16th chapter. The only other time it is used in the New Testament is in 1 Peter 2.22. And... People are all over the place trying to, try. I don't know why they just don't go. Now, good translators from the original text tell you it's a figure of speech, and they left it there. Because it's very difficult without some explanation to expl explain to you, because it's only used um, three times in the Gospel of John, and one time outside it. 
So it's a unique, uh, and it's something that John says Jesus used in the most unique understanding way. And the reason he did it, it means to run two things parallel to get to a conclusion. You run in two things parallel to get to one conclusion. Um, when I first came to the South, there was only one road to get you from Birmingham to Atlanta. It was called 78. Straight shot from Birmingham to Atlanta, right? Then they came along and built a highway, right? Highway 20. Built a superhighway, agreed? So now you got two parallel roads that go from Birmingham to Atlanta. Get you to the same place. Both, both read roads, as far as we're concerned, leave from Birmingham, Alabama, and take you to Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Parallel roads. I know you have to be up in age just a tad bit to know that there's a 78 used to take you to Atlanta. Because I go, I don't know about that 78 used to take me to Atlanta. But it used to be. This figure of speech is that. It's two parallels that get you to some place common, a common place. Okay? That's what this is really about in very simplistic form. All right? So we're going to talk about this truly, truly, I say unto you. Remember that this is a unique teaching technique that Jesus developed where he put a messianic doctrine and he told you ahead of time that what he was going to tell you was a very important messianic doctrine. Right? Now, we have studied this in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 8. Now we're in chapter 10. And we're not through. And they, they're, listen, they're all very important. They're the, they're the Christian doctrines of the church. You got to pay attention to them. All right? All right. Now, if you paid any attention to what we just read, you'll know that Jesus never, dis, never identified himself in that, in that uh, first six verses. He never identified himself. He never said who he was in it. Well, let's read it again just before we start, and I'll have a word of prayer with you because apparently you missed it. He's the, he doesn't say who he is. Listen to it. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who, he who, hey, he who. Right? Sounds like Spanish, doesn't it? He who. I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way. The he who is a, the he who, I almost called that by this, but I thought nobody understand it but me. He who, the he who is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, that's the night security guard, and the sheep hear his voice. In other words, he op lets the shepherd in. The shepherd, the sheep understand the sh shepherd's voice and leads them out. And when, when the shepherd put forth all of his own outside, the, the, he goes before them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. I speak in a paroyamai, a figure of speech. Okay? They did not get it. He never identified himself. He's not going to do that until they don't get it. They didn't get the meaning of the parallel, which is the parallel of chapter 9 and 10. They never got it. They never got what the Pharisees were fighting, what Jesus was promoting in chapter 9. The parallel, they never got it. Those that went through the whole hearing of the healing of the blind man never got it. They miss completely the messianic sign of healing a man who was born without eyes.
born blind. Never understood it. Even the enemies of Jesus Christ in chapter 9 says, there has never been a recorded miracle healing like this one. And they, they threw Jesus under the bus. They said there's no way. In fact, not only did they call him, not only did they not call him a miracle worker, not only did they not call him Christ, they called him a sinner. You talk about fake news. They called him a sinner. Even the blind man who got healed says, I don't care, then we ought to, everybody ought to be sinners if they can do this. Because only a person from God can heal somebody like that. And he was the miracle, talking miracle. You know, a lot of times you didn't get a talking miracle. You got it was a talking miracle. A grown man, blind from birth, no eyes, from birth can see. And those who have natural eyes cannot see because they're spiritually blind. Boy, I'm telling you, you could well be one of those people in this church today. You've got physical sight and spiritually blind because you don't understand the things of God. If you understood the things of God, you would be obedient to them. So, when this lesson comes out today, you know, the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed, is profitable. It's profitable when it rebukes you, when it corrects you, when it teaches you, and when it trains you in righteousness. And it's worth nothing if it doesn't do that because you've rejected its purpose. It's profitable for you when you let it work in your life. And it's not profitable. For, you can sit in church all day. You're never going to be that person. You're never going to be that person. This doesn't come by going to church. This comes by cycling the word of God into your soul and believing it. That's what Christianity is about. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about living the dynamics of the word of God out of your life, out of your soul. Listen. You didn't get saved just to check off your whole life on earth just because you can get to go to heaven, although that's true. Miss the whole journey. You've missed, you've missed verse 10 out of Ephesians 2. I'm, I'm getting revved up. Let me have a word of prayer. I'm about ready to give an invitation. Go home. Some of you say, praise the Lord. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. Let me tell you what this is for. This is for if you are aware of personal sin in your life, it could be mental attitude sins, it could be sins of the tongue, it could be overt signs, you confess them. You confess them right now in silence of your priesthood. You confess them to God so the Holy Spirit can teach you why you've come to church. You've come to church to hear the voice of God speak thunder in your soul so that you would become obedient to that because that's where the abundant good life is. Who doesn't want to live the full abundant life? Who doesn't want to pull out all the cobwebs out of their life and clean out their closet so that they can live a wholesome, steady life in Christ? You can't do that apart from obedience to the Word of God. No, Father, we know that. We know that. We know that in our souls. Those of us have tried this one way or the other, we know. The power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word is what molds us into the image of Christ. And that's where the good life is. That's our purpose on earth. I pray today, Father, this message would throw lightning within our souls, spiritually speaking. That we might come to a grip within ourselves of obedience to the Word of God. To do the things God says and not to do the things that he says do not do. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I know probably some of you who are visiting with me today probably think that I've designed this message just for you. The Lord has, but I haven't. So you can relax as far as I'm concerned. But listen, listen, know for sure 2 Timothy 3.16 says when you hear the word of God... If you're positive to it, it's going to have four effects upon your life. 
It's going to rebuke you. It's going to correct you. It is going to instruct you, and it's going to train you in righteousness, and those are all good things for you. Now, I want to talk about four things about this because it's not till we get to 7 through 21 that he identifies himself. Listen to how he identifies. He's going to say, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. Right? He does not say that here. Because he's already proved that in chapter 9. They should already know that. He's demonstrated it. He hasn't just talked about it. He has done it. He hasn't said, I am the door, I am the shepherd, and then he'll... No! He healed this man, and they should know that he is the shepherd. They should know he is the door. They should know he's the Savior. They should know he's the Messiah. He is the Christ. He showed them. Listen, the Jews were all about show and tell. Not tell and show. They were about signs. 1 Corinthians 1, 20, 22. So he does that. Chapter 9. Do you realize the healing and the dialogue from it? The healing of the blind man and the dialogue from it is the, is the longest dissertation on a healing, a messianic healing in the Bible. It goes from chapter 9 through the 10th chapter 21. That is all about that healing. There are 61 verses devoted to this to show that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's a lot of verses on one healing. That's a lot of verses. So point number one, we will begin by studying four ways, chapter 10, John 10, the truly, truly, which is going to have two sayings, are uniquely different. They are uniquely different. I'm going to tell you four reasons why they're uniquely different. Remember, this is the longest. It, chapter 9 through the 10th chapter, verse 21, is all about this. This is the event. You know, if you looked at Puerto Rico and didn't, didn't know anything about it, you, you were maybe in a coma for a couple weeks, and you came out of your coma, and you go like, well, well, honey, we got, I, the, before I went into coma, I've set up our, our honeymoon. We're going to Puerto Rico on our honeymoon. And we're, we'll be leaving as soon as I get well. I got, next week, we're going to Puerto Rico. So he said, boy, I got bad news for you. All right? There is no Puerto Rico. Well, you've been in, it's been wiped off the face of the earth. It'll probably be two or three years before we actually go and have a honeymoon there. Before it gets back and we've actually got flowers and trees and <laughs> whatever. We got an ocean, but we have no any. So what I want to I want to show you, this whole deal is wrapped up in this whole this whole chapter nine and almost half of 10 or more. That, so the first point is this. The first difference was linking verse 1 with verse 7. That's true. The two truly, truly I say unto you, look, verse 1. Look quickly down in your Bible. Verse 7. You got another one, right? Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Look, look, wait a minute. Take a deep breath. I'm not scolding you. If you're here today, and some reason you think I'm scolding I'm not scolding you. Look. I don't, know, I don't know anything about your life. Why do you think I'm scolding you? Relax. Take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Let the Father teach you. I'm not here, I'm not here trying to get all over your feet. I'm just trying to touch your... I'm, listen, I'm here to touch your soul. So look. The difference is, look, he does two truly trulys, but they're different. In the first one... Who do you think I am? Well, I just, he just gave you chapter 9, right? They, they, they went, I don't know. Some were saying, some say you're a sinner and I don't know. See? But in verse 7, because verse 6 says they did not understand this figure of speech. 
He, he comes right out and says who he is. I am the good shepherd. I am the door, right? So that's important. It, it, listen, the reason he did that from verse 7 through 21 is because they did not understand all of chapter 9 and first six verses of chapter 10, right? They didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. I, Listen, here's what we say. Well, you must be blind. Da-da. <laughs> blind. How could you not see that? Listen, I used to have a coach that say it all the time. How could you have missed that play? Are you blind? Then it might say blind as a bat. Because you couldn't do it if it was a night game, but anyhow. Point number two. The second difference was Jesus used a special Greek debater's technique called the parouomai. That's the Greek word that's used here. And, and all the translations are struggling with it. Now the NAS is going to call it a figure of speech, and that's correct. Translators, they identified as a parable, an allegory, or proverb as a rule, but that it's none of those. Okay? Point number three. The third difference, and, the, and this is a big part of the deal here, the third difference was that it was given, this true, the true, truly, trulys are given in response to the healing of the blind man who was blind from birth and is now an adult. I mean, he, he can vote. <laughs> I guess that's what we go for. I don't know. His parents said, his, his parents said, because they were afraid of the Supreme Court. They, listen, this went to the Supreme Court. The healing of this blind man from birth went to the Supreme Court. Because Jesus did it on the Sabbath, which was to prove Mark 2.27, that Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath, and he kept healing people on the Sabbath, and it should have went, it should have went ding, 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 ding. It didn't. They just drug him into court and then finally put him on a cross. My, 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 my. Third difference, they're responding. His parents in the, in the ninth chapter twenty one says, "Ask him. He's of age." Because they were good, they were threatening to kick him out of the, out of the synagogue. And, and listen, that meant take him out of all social stuff. You could listen. You couldn't get a driver's license. You couldn't get a loan. You couldn't do nothing if you got excommunicated. You talk about draining the swamp. Boy, this, is an, this was a nation that needed a swamp drain, and boy, will it come. And listen to me, people. When that swamp comes to be drained, it will be drained in the most hideous, horrible way called the fifth cycle of divine discipline in 70 A.D. by Rome upon Israel. Okay. Now I feel better. His parents refer to this man, a grown man of, of, of relative age, as a, a halikia, a halikia, and it means a, a, a well-established grown human being. Okay? Here's the fourth difference, was when this paroamaya, figure of speech, was not understood, uk ganasko, uh, uh, Aorist, active, indicative, third person plural, if you're interested in the Greek. And the figure was not understood. They, listen, that aorist tense goes all the way back to whole chapter 9. Went through all that healing to prove that a sign to Israel out of, out of Isaiah 61 that he was the Messiah. If the Messiah can do these things in Isaiah 61, you know he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. This was one of them. Listen, in order to call him a sinner after he did that healing, when Isaiah 61 called him the Messiah, is blasphemous, and yet they charge him with it. <laughs> they charged him with blasphemous when they actually were blasphemous. <laughs> Jeez. See, that's religion at it. That's religion at its best. Crucify the innocent. 
All right. The reason that was done this way, this special Greek technique, was to, he to hide the truth from the negative people and to reveal it to the positive. That, that's the way all parables or allegories or whatever, that's, that's how they were used. But this was a special technique for debating that Jesus used. Here's the second point. The controversy resulting from the healing of the blind man of John 9 led to our whole discussion in John 1 through 21. It is in these two places that we have two truly, truly messianic doctrines stated. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. Both of them are dealing with the same person. Looking at who the person. Listen, when he says I am, boy, that's a big deal. Remember in the John the 8th chapter 58, when he said, I am, they picked up stones, we're going we're gonna to do them in. And he turns around and heals the guy. They're ready to do it again when this is over. Negative to the truth. Listen, a pastor one time told me, people with negative relation to the truth that have heard it and reject it are like concrete. They're all mixed up and permanently set. Concrete. And what, you can't, they won't listen to you. The healing of the blind man was in response to his disciples' doctrinal error about a sinner status. This whole thing. They were going along. They were traveling along in, in ninth chapter 1 through 3. They were traveling along. Jesus sees this blind man. He stops and takes a look at the blind man and waits for his disciples. His disciples say, Lord, they all got their arms folded all around this poor blind man. Lord, let me ask you a question. This, 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 this blindness on this man, we know this man, this man's been blind since birth. I was supposed to have been in school with him, of course he's blind, so. But he, I, I knew this man. Now, we know that his blindness is because of sin. Is that sin come from him as a baby or did that sin come from his parents? Got to be one or the other, right? They all wondering, we bound to have an A in this deal. You know what he said? He said, neither. You guys are so out in the toolies. I added that. So I want you to look at the ninth chapter for a moment. I want, you to tell, I want you to see what he said that even his disciples didn't get, let alone the other people. He said to his disciples, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. Watch this now. Because this is why we have the parallel. This is why we have Highway 78 and Highway 20. Listen to what he said. But... It was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. He didn't say in me. He didn't say that the works of God might be displayed in me. That should have been an afterthought having seen it done in him. Come on now. So he prepares his disciples how this is going to work. It was in order that the works of God... See, that's what salvation is about. Salvation is about grace because it's the work of God, not of man. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. That's grace. It is God doing the work and man receiving the benefit. Listen. But it was in order that the works of God might be displayed, might be displayed in him. The miracle healing of absolutely sight. Go have your eyes checked. Come back. I don't know what's better in 2020, but if there was, he had it. You know how he got it? Listen, you know how he got it? It was the work of God was displayed in him, was displayed in him. A light went on in him. You understand? It was displayed in him. 
Then he turns to his disciples and said, we must work the works of, of him who sent me. As long as it is day and night is coming when no man can work. I am in the world. I am the light of the world. You understand what he just said to his disciples? And he reaches down into the mo mo gets, picks up some dirt, spits in it enough to make some salve out of it, right? Now, everybody else that has sight don't want this. But the guy who doesn't have sight, has never had sight, no eyes, likes this. I don't care what you do. Then he tells them, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam. I want you to bathe in it, and you'll be healed. <clears throat> he, listen, this is why he told his disciples, we must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day and night is coming when no man can work. I'm the light. I, I am in the world and I am the light of the world. <clears throat> now he's already told them that in 8th chapter verse 12. You understand that? This is not like a new, new idea. 8th chapter verse 12. I am the light of the world. <clears throat> All right. This is really important now. This is really important. Right? But it was that the work of God might be displayed in him. I want to quickly go over a few phases in chapter 9. What you can read on your own. Phase 1, the healing of the blind man. Blind man. I just explained how he did it to him. How he did it to him. <laughs> he goes, listen, he goes to the pool. He dunks himself out. He comes out and he's got eyeballs. And he can see perfectly. Never, seen, never, seen, never in his entire life has he been able to see. And he runs home. Do you know, you realize, how do you get home the rest of the time? You see, that old, that old cane or whatever stick he had or whatever, right? Yeah. Or somebody help him. But apparently there was nobody helping him because when he got sight, he ran home. Listen, he never run home before like that. You talk about a stranger. I mean, he, he, when he got to a corner, you know, it was by steps and it was by sounds. And what a, what a day that must have been when he left the pool and actually ran home with sight. And when he ran through the neighborhood, woo, when he ran through the neighborhood, everybody went, well, who was that? Because this is the way he usually went through the neighborhood, Right. Who's this kid? They looked at him. They looked at him and looked at him. And like, hey, that's Johnny Brown. Whatever his name was. No, they go like, that couldn't be him. That's that blind man kid. Yeah, that's a good, that, that, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. He busts through the house. His parents go like, hey, stranger. No, wait, that's Johnny Brown. What a day that must have been. He didn't run to find the man who healed him. He ran home to everybody that loved him when he was blind. <laughs> that old dog probably stayed off from him for him a little bit, right? That dog ran, come here, come here, Rex. Or maybe King. That dog go, I don't know who you are. It's me. Shut your eyes and listen to me. Oh, yeah, that's who you are. Look at He heals the blind man. News gets to the... gets in the swamp. And they say... Bring him into court. And they call a Supreme Court special meeting and drag him into court. Not because he was healed, but because he was healed on Sunday. I mean, what are the odds is that a blind man even cares that it's Sunday? Unless his parents say, I'm going to put you on this corner because there'll be more people coming by on the weekend for money. I mean, I got sight, and half the time, I forget what day it is. 
Oh, that day will come in your life too. Just wait. Right? Listen. They, and, they, and they bring him into court and say, tell us your story. He tells the story just as he understood it. And then they say to this man, well, this man is not from God. <laughs> and then the blind man goes, like, I don't understand that. And he said, because he did this on the Sabbath. He said, do you understand? I don't care what day of the week I got healed. And they said, well, you're a sinner too. Well, so what? At least I can see. Remember that famous line? Once I was blind, but now I see. What is your problem? That's a good question. He did get to it. The healed blind man brought, well, listen, then they released him, brought the parents in. The parents said he's of age, ask him, because they were fearful of the court to excommunicate him, and it would have just destroyed him. And so they bring the, the man, the blind man, who is now healed, bring him back into court a second time. They say to him, give glory to God. Do you know what? He did. And they threw him out. Because he said, okay, you want me to give glory to God? I'll tell you one thing. The man who healed me could not have done it apart from the work of God. Therefore, you want me to give glory to God? I give, it to, I give the glory to God. I give it because that man has to be from God. <laughs> and they threw him. They didn't throw him just out of court. They threw him out of life. When they, drew, when they threw him out, it means they excommunicated him. You couldn't get a driver's license. You couldn't get a work permit. You couldn't get nothing. <laughs> Jeez. Talk about the swamp. I don't know. He said, he said, I don't know. I don't know what you people are talking about. I know this, though. Once I was buying a doll, I said, don't you love that? What's your problem? Jesus, after he is excommunicated and thrown out, thrown out of Israel, so to speak, out of the life of Israel, Jesus seeks him out and has a wonderful conversation with him in verses 35 through 39. Well worth your read. He says to, he says to the blind man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, I don't know who the Son of Man is. Well, you do know he's the Messiah. Yeah, I do that, but I, you know, I don't have a clue. He said, I love this line. He said then, look up here. Look up here. Let me ask you to do something you never could do any other period in your life. Look up here. Do you see me? Got a good look? I'm him. Let that sink for a minute, son. Let that sink for a minute. Let it sink for just a minute in your life. Don't, don't, let it sink. I want you to look up here. I want you to get a good look at me. You don't, see, you don't have to put your hands on my face and do all that. I want you to get a good look. You got a good look? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'm the son of man. I'm the guy who healed you. Well, I know your voice was familiar. No, I'm the guy. But I'm, I am the son of man. I am the Messiah. And what I just did for you was the work of God through me. You know what he said? Look, I believe. You know, you're, you, if you're not a believer, if this one moment, second in time, your life can be changed dramatically, spiritually, positionally. When you believe that Jesus came into this world to die for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead third day. Let me tell you something else. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and your life has got mucho problems, I mean, half the time you don't know if you ought to be doing this or ought to be doing that or going this way or going that way, let me tell you. Just as simple, a change in your life can come by the power of God just as simple as when you got saved. Listen to me now. And just as simply as it came to this man. But Jesus, when he put the mud in his eyes, he didn't say, and you're healed like he did most of the time. He said this for your benefit today. He said, I want you to act upon this. 
I want to see some obedience. I want to see, I want to see a response to something. I want you to leave here and go to the pool and wash yourself in the pool and see the miracle of God. He made him go from there to there so that when he washed himself in the obedience to what the man told him, what the man told him was true. And I'm telling you today as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is all this and all that. Look, it's okay. It's okay. Look, it's okay. We all, we all come into this world blind, spiritual blind. The secret, once you get saved, is not to live in spiritual blindness. Don't be blind anymore. Get your eyes open to what God, and listen, start making choices that you know are right for God. And listen, he'll put you on a journey of changing all the messed up. Listen, it, we're all messed up. Unless you got saved at birth, we're all messed up. The secret is not stay there. And if you're looking to a thousand and one ways, 12 steps here or 13 steps there or 20 steps there or whatever, listen, the step that's most important to change your life to where it is, to put it where it ought to be, is obedience to what the word when Jesus tells you to, to leave that and go there, to go from here to there, you need to go from there to there and watch a miracle happen in your life. The word of God is powerful, sharpened a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and will become that critic of thought and intention of the heart will change your life. The word of God. You got to put yourself in a place where the word of God can speak to your heart and you know that it's truth. And then you become obedient to that truth. And listen to me. You want to see a miracle work in your life? It's not going to come through some, something outside you. It's going to come when you take the word of God in and become obedient to it. And you watch that word of God change you internally, externally. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth because I've gone through this. I'm the blind man who can see. I never want to be blind again. I never want to be blind again. So I want to live in obedience of sight. Well, the rest of this you can study on your own. It'd be well worth your time. And next time we're going to come back in this study, and we will really get after this of now he declares, since nobody understands, he's going to declare it. He's going to discuss it in great detail. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. Uh, we'll take a moment, a uh, little fellowship downstairs with some donuts and coffee and stuff like that. And then we'll come back for the Eucharist in the second hour. Let's pause and pray. If you're with us today, both by the internet as well as in the auditorium, you've never had that life-changing experience. You're, you were born blind spiritually. Let me tell you, the moment you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, you can have spiritual sight. You can become enlightened from the internal side of your life in that silent dialogue where you're always discussing and blaming yourself for a thousand and one things can be removed at the point of salvation. But now you have the Holy Spirit as the great teacher to your human spirit and soul. And for those who are with me today, who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you came into Christianity with a whole lot of issues. We know that. All of us have. If you got saved at any strength, you come from backgrounds of family and bad decisions and all kinds of stuff. But listen, your life can be changed. I'm talking about miraculously changed. When you allow the Word of God to work its work in you, like Hebrews 4.12, where it's, you allow yourself to go under surgery. It, it is interesting how, how the writer of Hebrews says that. The cutting of the, the, from the soul and the spirit through the bones and the marrow to get down where it has to do its work. See, there's a processing. There's a processing. But you're open to the surgery. There's a processing. You're open to the word of God. And the power of the Word of God will begin to develop and work in your life. 
There's a process. It begins with positive volition. It begins to allow yourself uh, to be obedient to the Word of God. Don't give in to all those things that contribute to sustaining your bad decisions. Come to, come to the Word of God that offers you a whole new avenue of decision making. And in it comes the abundant life in Christ. I tell you the absolute truth. Father, we're thankful today for this. I pray that those who are listening by the internet as well as those that have traveled by automobile with us today would take all of this serious. This has been an encounter meeting with Jesus Christ. This has been an encounter meeting. And God has touched your heart. Be obedient to that. Respond to that. Be obedient to that. Allow God to do a work in you. Not just to save you, but to do a great work within your soul. Become a critic and thought of the intentions. That inner dialogue that keeps condemning yourself can be changed. Can be changed because it's about Jesus. It ain't about you, it's about Jesus. And Jesus wants your life to be healthy and well prosperous and good when you can say doing the will of God is good for me it's acceptable and it's perfect for my life that's what we want father I pray that in Jesus name amen